On this Friday night, growing concerns for Haiti. And this is the most important year of all since I, I, Haiti's independence. We talked to Canadians with deep ties to the troubled nation where angry protesters fill the streets. Why the Haitian president says he won't step aside. We're talking about an invasion of our country. Donald Trump declares a national emergency at the U.S.-Mexico border, freeing up money for his long-promised wall. We'll look at why it's far from a done deal. What should I do if I'm ever in the situation with an abusive coach? And after we dug up hundreds of cases of sexual abuse in amateur sport, you sent us your questions. Tonight, we answer them. This is The National. Desperate rage in Haiti has fueled violent protests for more than a week now, and a long-awaited announcement by their president has done nothing to quell the fury. That is grim news for more than 150 Canadians stranded there. Road travel is so dangerous, most won't risk driving to the airport, but overnight, five of them did. Last night, we told you about Dr. Emilio Bazil, who went with four Canadian colleagues to offer medical services and supplies. What worries me is more the panic. Um, he, my dad doesn't usually panic, and he has this panic in his voice. Dr. Bazil and his team braved a journey from a port city to the airport in the capital, normally 115 kilometers, but blockades forced them onto side roads and stretched the trip to seven and a half harrowing hours. Please do not do what I did because you can get killed, he told the Canadian press. You have to pay every time you pass somewhere. You have to pay somebody $500. Sometimes they ask $1,000 to allow you to pass. They finally hired an ambulance for $250 because emergency vehicles are allowed through the roadblocks. It was worth it. They are now out of the country. So how did Haiti get to this point? The poorest country in the Americas was pushed even closer to desperation by punishing inflation and apparent government corruption. Last fall, it emerged that billions of dollars from a Venezuelan oil deal was missing and no one was being charged. In one day, six people were killed during protests. Since then, double-digit inflation has driven up the cost of living. Over the last nine days, things have reached a breaking point. Right now, the hospitals are not working. Um, um, you can't really find, like, clean water to drink. It might be worse than when we have, like, natural disaster. Because you know that, all right, the storm will go and the sun will rise again. But now it's, it's just that a country locked down because of a political situation and an economy situation. Now the president, Jovenel Moise, has brushed off demands that he resign and promised measures to ease the deprivation. Right now, the situation is so dire, the Canadian government said today it's halting all deportations to Haiti. Montreal is home to Canada's largest Haitian community. The CBC's Allison Northcott talked to some of them. Probably 2015 or 16, I don't As a photojournalist, Danielle Morel has had his eye on Haiti for decades, capturing images of natural disasters and political uprisings. He says the latest protests are different. The difference is the frustration of the people, uh, the arrogance of this government. He's eager to return to Haiti to see what's happening now and says the violence won't deter him. Violence is very important now. If it was not for the violence, the government not going to even give a damn. The ongoing protests have been a recurring topic on the air at Montreal's Haitian radio station, where Jean-Ernest Pierre says he and others in the Haitian diaspora are worried for the country's future. My soul aches for my country, he says. He adds that Haiti's president has lost control, failed to deliver on promises many Haitians were counting on and should step down. Some of the Canadians stuck in Haiti are on humanitarian missions, like Montreal nurse Catherine O'Neill. Where we are, we are safe. We are safe on the compound. We do not have safe passage to the airport. There are uh, roadblocks in place, barricades, burning tires. Uh, those barricades are manned. They do not allow you to pass. She says she's disappointed by the Canadian government's response and worries about running out of food, water and fuel and losing cell service. 
Also stuck is a group of 26 high school students and their chaperones from Victoriaville, Quebec. The school board says they are far from the violence in the capital and that it's working to get them home safe. As for the 113 tourists unable to leave this resort, Quebec's premier says Air Transat is orchestrating a rescue plan to use helicopters to get them to the airport, then on a flight back to Canada tomorrow. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Donald Trump has gone through with a threat he's been making for weeks, declaring a national emergency to free up billions to build his long-promised wall. And for just about as long, there have been threats of lawsuits and other legal consequences. So the question is, what happens now? Ellen Morrow has reaction. There was no surprise in how President Trump justified his declaration. We're talking about an invasion of our country with drugs, with human traffickers, with all types of criminals and gangs. Never mind that illegal border crossings have overall been on the decline, Trump declared a national emergency, sidestepping Congress to free up $8 billion to build a wall that candidate Trump promised Mexico would pay for. It's a great thing to do. But was declaring a national emergency actually necessary? Not really, said Trump himself. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this. A line seized upon by California's attorney general as he announced a lawsuit to stop the wall being built. As the president said himself, he didn't have to do this. There's no emergency here for the nation. I expect that we'll see that quote in all of the briefs that are filed against him. And those lawsuits could mean months, maybe years, before any ground is broken as the courts consider. Whether the president is trying to do an end around uh, Congress's exclusive authority uh, over the purse. And as we know, the only real reason why he's just sort of unilaterally declared a, uh, an emergency is because he couldn't get Congress to agree to fund the wall. Uh, the president know, seems ready there, for the fight. And we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake, and we'll win in the Supreme Court. House Democrats have already launched their own investigation, accusing President Trump of a reckless disregard for the Constitution. So what's the end game here? Well, even though he knows any construction will be delayed and that he might not win in the courts, declaring a national emergency allows President Trump to tell his base that he did everything he could to fulfill a campaign promise. That's an important message going into 2020. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. The term national emergency might make you think presidents use the extraordinary power for events happening in the United States, but it turns out most of the time that's not the case. Most have actually been about foreign policy, sanctioning specific governments or targeting the spread of weapons of mass destruction. In fact, of the last 59 national emergencies declared before today, just three had to do with emergencies in the U.S. Relaxing certain requirements during the H1N1 flu epidemic, after Hurricane Katrina, and in the wake of 9-11, assuming broad powers, including being able to redirect funding for military construction, similar to what Trump hopes to do now, but for an emergency a lot different than 9-11. Well, for more on the political context for the U.S. president, let's turn to Keith Bogue in Washington. And Keith, let's begin with, with how Trump got to this point. Well, he got here by promising something he had no idea how to deliver. Remember, he said he was going to build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. It was a great line for campaign rallies because it was such a vivid image to remind his base that he stood for keeping people they don't like out of the country. The trouble is that people on the right, such as Ann Coulter, have built careers on policing the promises politicians make about immigration and the border. So they love Trump for what he promised to do, but are unforgiving when he fails to do it. And Trump apparently cares a lot about what they think. Today, he tried to look as though he's still their champion, still fighting the fight. But Coulter said today, the real national emergency in America is that the president is an idiot. So that's what he got for his efforts. So we've heard that the, the, the fate of this wall is, is far from certain. How does this play out for him? 
Well, it looks like all this is going to be tied up in the courts until after the 2020 election. So you see Trump today preparing his arguments for the campaign about how none of it's really his fault. He blamed the Republican leadership for not moving ahead with the wall in the first days of his presidency. And he was rehearsing his complaints against the courts if they get in his way now. And that's likely to work with his base. I mean, if he believes he could, as he said, shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't cost him a single vote, he surely believes he can get away with blaming someone else for not keeping his border wall promised. But it might cost him among the reluctant Trump voters he got in 2016, not because they care about the wall, but because they don't. They've seen the president waste time, money, and even shut down the government for it and ultimately fail. And that looks like incompetence. Thank you, Keith. If Trump gets the $8 billion he's looking for through the emergency declaration, it's expected to pay for 376 kilometers of fencing. That is less than a quarter of what he originally said he wanted to build. Let's turn to Canadian politics now. And it's been a rough week for the Prime Minister, facing relentless questions over the SNC-Lavalin story and the resignation of his former Justice Minister. Justin Trudeau insists that Jody Wilson-Raybould was not pressured to steer the corruption and fraud case against SNC-Lavalin away from a courtroom, but he's not revealing much else, and that is only prompting more questions. Katie Simpson walks us through the latest. This week has been so difficult for the Prime Minister that at an announcement with BlackBerry, the company's CEO joked about Justin Trudeau's political woes. And one thing I found consistent in the last six years is the support that we got from the Canadian government, sometimes not so much from the Canadian media. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people resonate with that. Um, okay. Uh, Trudeau faced another round of questions on the SNC-Lavalin affair, admitting his former justice minister pressed him directly about the issue. Jody uh, uh, Wilson-Raybould asked me uh, if uh, if I was directing her or going to direct her to take a particular decision, and I, of course, said no. Trudeau acknowledged the intense lobbying by the Quebec firm and provincial politicians, but denies his office tried to pressure Jody Wilson-Raybould into killing the court case against SNC-Lavalin. But he would not rule out that her demotion to Veterans Minister in January was because she refused to intervene. There are always uh, a wide range of factors that go into, uh, into making that decision. But as I said, if Scott Bryson had not stepped down suddenly over the Christmas break, there would not have been a cabinet shuffle. Trudeau's non-committal answers are frustrating the opposition. So to me, that just means we really need to get to the bottom of the entire story. The Conservatives and NDP say Trudeau must waive solicitor-client privilege and cabinet confidence rules to allow Wilson-Raybould to give her side of the story. She should be able to talk to the Canadian people and he should stop hiding behind this claim of solicitor-client privilege. It just makes him look bad. The day-by-day -day slow drip of new information from the Prime Minister is fueling this saga. And with MPs returning to Ottawa next week, Justin Trudeau will face fresh calls for more transparency. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. A man from Ontario was charged today with the first-degree murder of his own daughter after an overnight Amber Alert came to a heart-wrenching end. 11-year-old Rhea Rajkumar was reported missing around dinner time yesterday, Valentine's Day. It was also her birthday and the birthday of her now grieving mother. She was out with her father, Rupesh Rajkumar, but never returned. Her body was found in his Brampton, Ontario home around midnight, just a short while after an Amber Alert was issued. Today at Rhea's school, grief counselors were brought in. It's just really sad. <laughs> she was really nice. As neighbors gathered at a memorial near the crime scene, relatives of the accused said they had no idea what was going on until they saw the Amber Alert. He was always a cousin to look up to. Like, it, it, we just never expected this to happen. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. He's totally shocked. We don't know, you know, I don't even, it's not like we were speech, speechless. We can't even move when we saw that and heard this bad news. A motorist who also heard that Amber Alert helped police find the father just minutes later, 130 kilometers away. He's now in custody in a hospital with an undisclosed medical condition.
Police are touting his arrest as a success for the Amber Alert system, but it didn't save Rhea. As Ron Charles tells us, there are questions about whether the police moved quickly enough. This is what people in Ontario saw and heard on their mobile phones last night just after 1130. But this Amber Alert was issued almost five hours after little Rhea Rajkumar was reported missing by her mother. Rhea's father, Rupesh Rajkumar, had the child and had sent concerning messages. The Ontario Provincial Police administers the Amber Alert system and requires cases to meet three criteria. The first criteria is the child has to be under the age of 18. The second criteria is they have to be believed to be in danger. And the third criteria is there has to be uh, information, informative description, sorry, on one of three things, the, the child, the suspect or the vehicle. Police in Brampton, Ontario, say Rhea's case appeared to meet those criteria, but officers had to investigate first. Maybe it isn't that what they think. We want to cover everything off, right? We, we don't want to leave anything unturned. Obviously, when we realize, you know, we're not getting it, or we're extremely concerned for their well-being, we put out our, we fill out the form with OPP for the Amber Alert. Also of concern, shortly after Rhea was reported missing, officers knocked at the door of her father's house where the body was eventually found. But they left without going inside because there was no answer and no car in the driveway. It was only hours later that they finally forced their way in. At some point in the investigation, they received enough information that they felt that the, that the girl, the 11-year-old girl, would, could in fact be in the residence and was in need of assistance. So with that information, that threat for somebody's life, they were able to force entry. The police were asked if they'll review their policy on forced entry when looking for a child. We want to finish dealing with this portion of the investigation, and perhaps that would be something that would be looked at later. Small comfort for a mother, family, and community now in grief. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. That late night Amber Alert also led to hundreds of 911 calls, and we're not talking about tips to locate the suspect. The calls were to lodge complaints about being woken up by the alert. Police were un unapologetic, tweeting, as a direct result of someone receiving the alert, we were able to locate the suspect and his vehicle. The system works. Tonight, we spoke to one officer who expressed disappointment about the response. I'm a parent myself to a young, uh, to a young daughter, and I can't begin to imagine what the family of Rhea is going through. Shortly after we put out the Amber Alert, uh, myself and Constable Taryn Hill were the media officers last night. We fielded uh, well over a dozen phone calls. It's frustrating, it's disappointing. It's a five minute inconvenience to them. Uh, to which could potentially help uh, help our investigators. Despite the a number of complaints we received on the Amber Alert uh, system coming through to people's phones, radios, or TV, uh, we have for every one complaint we had three positive com uh, comments uh, from people that were appreciative of the Amber Alert. So. Some of the stories we're following tonight on The National. Health officials here in Vancouver have now identified eight cases of measles linked to three French schools and one in particular, Nicole Jules Verne. Cases are occurring in staff, and staff students and family members uh, affiliated with the school. One of those individuals visited the emergency department of BC Children's Hospital while they were infectious. Officials say they haven't been able to contact everyone who may have been exposed in that instance. They also say the disease was brought in through travel outside of North America. British newspaper The Daily Telegraph says Scotland Yard is investigating an allegation of sexual assault described as groping against former BC Premier Gordon Campbell. The alleged victim says she made a formal complaint in 2014 while Campbell was serving as Canada's High Commissioner to Britain. The newspaper quotes a spokesperson for Campbell saying there was an investigation at the time by the Government of Canada and the complaint was found to be without merit. Still ahead on The National. After our in-depth investigation revealed hundreds of cases of sexual assault in minor sports, you had questions. So Andrew puts them to a panel of experts. And forced out of their dream homes, will take you to the Sunshine Coast neighborhood in British Columbia, evacuated because of sinkholes. Plus the big money world of mommy blogging. Deanna Sumanak Johnson goes behind the Instagram filter for a real life look at the industry. They 
wanted us to do outings in the car and she had tears just pooling in her eyes and she's like please mom don't make me do this If you become a parent in the last decade, chances are you've either read one or written one yourself. Mommy blogs have become a popular way for new mothers to share the joys and frustrations that come with having children. And for some, it's also become a lucrative job. The mommy space is now really, really big with regards to, you know, advertisers or like brands trying to work with, with moms in particular. Mommy bloggers are a major part of influencer marketing, where brands pay social media personalities to feature their products in their posts. By 2020, researchers say companies will invest five to ten billion dollars in this type of advertising. But as Deanna Sumanag Johnson explains, all of that money comes with its own challenges. Hatsy, this one's cute. At first, Anna Sinclair's Instagram posts about her life as a new mom were just a creative outlet and a way to connect with other women. Then she realized they could be something more. As the number of women following her grew, companies started sending her products to feature on her page in exchange for money or goods. Well, I understood that people were making money from blogging, but I thought it was just the Kim Kardashians of the world. I didn't think that a regular mom like me would get paid to do this. But regular moms are a huge market for companies, which is why advertisers are continuing to court mommy bloggers. An average mom influencer makes $50 to $100 per sponsored post, while the top bloggers make six figures per year. There's a huge connection between the person following them and the mommy blogger. They come to trust this person. They start to value her opinion on multiple matters, whether it's child raising or products that they sell. Events like this one show just how big of a business mom blogging and influencer marketing has become. The Toronto Total Mom Show brings together dozens of vendors with over a thousand women, many of them bloggers themselves. But with such rapid growth of business come its own challenges. Featuring stories and photos of your children for millions to see is a major component of mommy blogging. And that can get ethically tricky, as it did for blogger Heather Armstrong. They wanted us to do outings in the car and go places and play word games in the car. And my kids hated it. And my child, I believe she was four or five at the time, she looked up at me as we're getting into the car and she had tears just pooling in her eyes and she's like please mom don't make me do this armstrong don't quit her blog for two years as a result now she's back but runs all of her posts by her kids who are now nine and 15 and there are other potential pitfalls from too much advertising in your posts according to our research the more that these bloggers shift from providing an experience from showing their personality to sharing their family moments to promoting products that level of trust is starting to diminish. Say thank you, Mama. Yeah, Mama. You're welcome. Anna Sinclair says You're she tries welcome. to walk that fine line, staying true both to her followers and her children. Yeah. We always talk about how this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. We can still make money and do this, but not have to be gone away from our kids all day. Is that a good one? Yeah. It's a good one, yeah. Deanna Sumanag Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And after the break. What should I do if I'm ever in the situation with an abusive coach? Do you think that you are able to fairly investigate yourselves um, in cases of sexual misconduct? What can we do at the grassroots level to recruit more coaches to increase the pool of people that we're pulling from? You had questions about stopping sexual abuse in amateur sport. These are the people with the answers. Stick around. Well, what I saw was the guy running down the aisle and with a pistol and with a laser on it. There's been another mass murder in the U.S., this time at a manufacturing company in Illinois, killing at least five people. Police officers ran inside the building. That's when a shootout began. Five officers were wounded, and the gunman identified as Gary Martin was killed. At this point, investigators say they don't know the motive, but Martin was an employee of the company. Colin Kaepernick has reached an undisclosed settlement in his collusion case against the NFL. The former San Francisco 49ers quarterback started kneeling during the national anthem to protest police treatment of African Americans. 
It became a national controversy, and Kaepernick, who left the 49ers, hasn't played since 2016. He accused other team owners of conspiring not to hire him. A CBC investigation into amateur sport has been followed today by a message from the federal sports minister. She's promising action when it comes to harassment, abuse and discrimination. Our expert panel is about to answer your questions, but first, news about a pledge from politicians right across Canada. This is a long-standing, not talked about issue in sport, and I wanted to change that. I want sport to be safe for children. Not many details have been released. We do know it includes commitments to eliminate gender-based violence against women and girls and work on concussion prevention and awareness. All this week, we've brought you coverage of a joint investigation by CBC News and CBC Sports that for the first time collected and counted sexual offense convictions across all sports over the last 20 years. The findings, hundreds of cases deep. At least 222 amateur athletic coaches have been found guilty. More than 600 kids victims of their offenses. Our rinks, gyms, stadiums, fields, they are familiar places where kids develop a sense of self, where many people volunteer their time and where others build careers. So how do we keep them safe for everyone? I'm Todd Jackson, Director of Insurance and Risk Management with Hockey Canada, and I know the importance of creating a safe sporting environment. I'm Lorraine Lafreniere. I'm the CEO of the Coaching Association of Canada, and I share in caring about a safe sports system. I'm Karen Kennedy, President of Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Centre, and I believe that by working together, we can prevent child sexual abuse. I'm Don Smythe, Director of Domestic Development at Canada Basketball. I'm familiar with the challenges with the NSOs, committed to fixing them and making sports safe. We have had so much reaction to these stories and a lot of questions too. You've been sending them in. So let's get to question number one. My name is Tara Zeri. I'm the mother of a 17-year-old hockey player. The question I have for the panel is how do I talk to our son about sexual abuse in sport? How do we educate him? And what are the red flags we watch for as parents? Okay, so a few parts to that question. And Karen, maybe I'll start with you if you can tackle the first part. So, so how to talk, Tara wants to know how to talk to her son about abuse. Sure, well there's important messages that you need to give to your kids. And they include things like, it's your body, you get to say who touches it and how. You've got to trust your feelings. If you feel uncomfortable about a situation, tell somebody and tell someone you trust and keep telling until they do something about it. You know, it's hard to say as a blanket rule, you know, no touching because we all know sports and you know, I think of gymnastics. There's a lot of touching that goes on yeah. by necessity. Are there hard and fast rules that you, you kind of give to parents and say, this, this is what you're, you should just tell your kid right out of the gate? Well, I think the most important one is that touching should never ever be a secret, that you can always talk about it. If, if it's a touch that that you can't talk about, then there's something wrong. Lorraine, the other part of Tara's question was around red flags, how to spot them, what to look for in coaches. How would you respond to that? Uh, the red flag for me is what I call isolating events. Anything that puts a young person alone with a coach is an isolating event, whether it's on social media and texting or off the field to play in the locker room. And so that's what parents should watch for and talk to their children about is the expectations in the clubhouse. We're great at the field to play, but we've got to talk about the clubhouse and travel and accommodation and make sure no one is ever left alone. Text, texting is an interesting side to isolation, right? That, that may not be first and foremost when people, parents think about that. Uh, you know, following, if being friends on social media, w would you include that? In, in the Absolutely. pattern of behavior to avoid? We recommend no one-on-one -on -one communication on Messenger, on Facebook, on Twitter, on texting. Really, there should always be a person on the copy line. Todd, from, from Hockey Canada's point of view, when you, when you hear these sorts of suggestions, mm -hmm. are, are they 
written down, sort of hard and fast rules in the policy? You know, certainly uh, as we've built our, our information, we have put tips in. And we actually have a parent guide on our website at, at hockeycanada.ca. And in that parent guide, uh, there, are, there are answers, I think, to some of the questions that, that have just been asked here. Uh, what do I watch for? What are the tips? Where do I go? And, and, uh, and, and how do I react to these types of situations? But, so, but I guess, I mean, the, that puts the onus on parents, though, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking more along, you know, hard policy guidelines that coaches have to follow. No texting, no following on social media. Rule of two, you know, any, if you have a power relationship, I, I, you should absolutely. not be alone. There are uh, policies coming up all over the country with respect to social media, with respect to um, dressing room, too deep rule. Uh, those are all really important steps and, and uh, you know, that education pillar is so, so important in getting that to the coach's hands. and. and that way setting those expectations. Don, I'm going to let you jump in here, but, but sure. first I, I want to hear, there's another question here. This is actually from Tara's son, Stieg. Have a listen. Hello, my name is Stieg Zeri, and I'm a 17-year-old hockey player and golfer. My question is, what should I do if I'm ever in the situation with an abusive coach? And what should I do to follow up this scenario? You can speak from Canada basketball's sure. point of view. What is, what is the rule in place when an athlete encounters a situation that, that he or she feels is inappropriate or abusive? Yeah, I think it's really important for them to get into action right away. And so uh, to trust their feelings, trust their gut, uh, and to get to start reporting. Um, and so reporting that could, to whom? Yeah, so that could be anyone from their parents. It could be anyone from anyone within the club association. I mean, from Canada Basketball's perspective, Canada Basketball is always there for our members. And if um, they need to turn to anyone, they can absolutely turn to us as well as our provincial and territorial organizations. But I think that the purpose and the, the first step is to actually just get in contact. There's, there's another question that we got, and, and it very much relates to the process that unfolds. Have a listen. My name is Kira McCormack, and I'm a former professional soccer player from Vancouver. My question is directed to the NSOs, and it's do you think that you are able to fairly investigate yourselves um, in cases of sexual misconduct by your members without there being some kind of a conflict of interest? And um, do you even think that it's fair that the onus should be on you to do so? Don, maybe you can start us off on that one. I mean, this idea of yeah. reporting internally. I think, uh, I mean, we have policies on place uh, that's on our website at basketball.ca and we actually put together an outside committee to actually take care of it. So it's not done within this full-time staff or, you know, anyone who's around that coach. It's being put to a committee um, that's been appointed that's outside of the NSO so that it's actually very fair and arbitrary in order to deal with it um, and uh, get to a resolution. But this, this is a committee that's appointed by whom, right? Because, yeah. I mean, there can still be a conflict there. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, the intention to create it is to have no conflict. I think at the end of the day, as an NSO, we want to solve. We do not want this uh, for our athletes. Uh, we do not want this in, a, in our sport. Sorry, just to jump sure. in, it's actually much simpler than that. Any suspicion of child sexual abuse um, of a child 18 or under mm -hmm. has to be reported to the authorities. So before it gets to that point, it really, it's just tell somebody you trust get that person to do something, um, make that call to a child protection agency or police, and then depending on what the outcome is, then your process comes in. But the Absolutely. very first step is making that call to report it. Lorraine, I mean, just on the, the question, I mean, ought there to be a, a third party entity that, that is always in place to, to address these sorts of complaints? Yes, absolutely. We do need independence because people automatically fear retribution, whether real or perceived. So an independent avenue for a helpline, whether it's kids' help form, whether it's children's aid, is really important to help the system stay transparent and accountable. So um, I do think these internal mechanisms are also important because it helps the organization to understand what's going on, get a baseline, and if they deal with it effectively, they get to correct the behavior and fix the situation so they eliminate it from their sport. So it's a balance of both. And, but who pays for all of that? I mean, to, to set up a, a whole infrastructure around that. I think that is what the system is currently wrestling with completely. Uh, we do have some provinces, uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, that actually have helplines in place. We, the Coaching Association of Canada, have a 
partnership with Kids Help Phone, so we contribute to that organization in exchange for support. Uh, we work with the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. There are so many existing agencies, uh, child welfare, child support agencies, that we can partner with these people, but there is a gap in the system and we do need to address it. So, so anytime you have a sort of power relationship, right, between a coach and an athlete, anytime you raise an issue, no matter how you raise it, it can feel like you're, you're, you're jeopardizing everything you've invested, everything that you've, all the work that you've put into it, that, that you may compromise the relationship somehow by raising an issue. And the less egregious the offense becomes, the harder the question is, right? An athlete has to ask this impossible question of themselves. I mean, is this worth raising? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, how any do you any good it? coach, though, it wants to make sure that their athlete performs in their best ability. And if they're doing something that's making an athlete uncomfortable or not being able to perform at that, that level, any um, ethical coach would take that information and make those adjustments so that their athlete would be in the best situation for them to perform. So I don't think it's an either or. You don't have to say, I, I have to be uncomfortable in order to stay with this coach or in this club or in this situation. There's lots of clubs. We're in a big country, fortunately. Um, and you have a lot of choices to be there, and it's not an either or. We have another question. This is coming to us from Jay about coaches. Hi, my name is Jay Bowes. I'm a father of two and a coach of, in multiple sports. Every year we struggle finding enough coaches. It seems if you're breathing, we'll take you. So my question is, what can we do at the grassroots level to recruit more coaches to increase the pool of people that we're pulling from so we don't necessarily have to keep the coaches that maybe we prefer not to? Okay, so, so this is a real, a real reality question, right? Todd, how do you encourage coaches? You know, I, I think we want to make sure that we're, that we're bringing coaches in and that we're giving them all the tools they need, all the resources they need to be good coaches and, and to know what is crossing the line and what is not crossing the line. Right. Do, so, Lorraine, let me ask you about that. I mean, does it feel like a, a safe environment from a coaching perspective? And I, and I wonder if there's an anxiety from coaches about this sort of new era that we're, we're in, especially compared to 20 years ago. There is an anxiety for certain, and I think what makes great coaches even greater is when they embrace it and talk about it and be transparent about how they're working in a safe sporting environment. So the recommendation I have for coaches is don't shy away, uh, be very public in your conversation, walk through the rules with participants and parents, talk about what they should be expecting in the clubhouse, in the training ground, on the away games, and make everyone understand it. Great coaches become even greater when they share in this type of challenge to make sport better. We have one more question that we want to get to. This is from Shamir. Hello, my name is Shamir Kanji. I'm a coach and a director over at the Canada Youth Basketball Association. We serve roughly a thousand kids in Canada and the neighboring areas. I'm also a father of two boys, age nine and 11. How do we as smaller organizations that are run almost exclusively by volunteers, how do we assess where we stand with regards to protecting our youth uh, and where the gaps exist? So getting it right down, right, to yeah. the club level and offering them the support that they need. Dawn, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, we've got a, a couple of different things. I think um, the first is, you know, what we have about is a, a club excellence. And it's a standard that we have on our website, again, basketball.ca. And it talks about what are some of those minimal standards to become an excellent club. And, uh, you know, knowing that to clubs differ in different ways around the country and that have different resources, they have um, something that they can measure themselves against. Is there is there more, though? That, because, you know, you think of publishing policies and guidelines and rules and suggestions yep. on websites, sometimes that's where they stay. First of all, we've got to provide easy to use tools. So, you know, I'll start with education. Uh, we started with an in-class type of scenario 15 years ago. We've moved to online and, and through respect and sport. And now we're seeing that grow in our culture. Uh, it's, it's part of everyday business. Uh, every coach is taking it. Every volunteer is taking it in most cases. I, I think it takes time. It takes, it takes um, patience and not to not to wait till it's perfect to put something in place. Mm -hmm. What about mandating clubs to, to make sure that they follow best practices and best guidelines and, and for there to be consequences if they don't? 
Well, I think some sport organizations have done that, and we're seeing governments shift towards making sure, just like they do with concussion policies, that they have safe sport policies across the country. One thing I might add here is Clubs need to think about it as not a pass-fail. This is not about I'm failing, it's about I'm improving. And you know, safety is not an endpoint, it's a journey. And so to keep that conversation alive and be transparent about where things are weak and where they're strong is actually the point to getting better as a club. Karen, Todd, Don, Lorraine, a lot to get through in a relatively short amount of time, <laughs> but thank you for your time, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, thanks for talking about it. And next on The National, 14 families spent the day scrambling to get out of their houses. Their neighborhood on BC's Sunshine Coast under threat of sinkholes. We walked around for the first two days in shock, depressed, mm -hmm. just not knowing what to, to do. It was, it's, been, it's been brutal. So what's next for these families? We'll tell you right after this. Million dollar dream homes with expansive views of BC's south coast are sitting empty tonight. The families who live there are forced to pack up and clear out because of dangerous sinkholes. It's happening in an upscale neighborhood of Seashell, a picturesque town accessible only by ferry, about 50 kilometers northwest of Vancouver. As Greg Rasmussen reports, there's no word on whether the homeowners will ever be able to return or who's going to bear the cost. That's the stuff that we are leaving behind. The remains of an idyllic oh, retirement, abandoned. The rest carted off into an uncertain future. It's yeah. just horrific. It's, it's cruel. It um, did not need to be put out this way. Donna and Rod Goy are one of 14 families ordered out of their homes. We worked all our lives to get to buy our dream home. And uh, we... You know, we put everything, all our money is here. Everything is invested in our home. After years of problems, today the area was sealed shut. They made the decision this time to close this neighborhood down. They gave almost zero notification. And they did it during probably the worst weather that we could ever imagine to have to go through this. This drone video shot by one of the residents shows what's at stake. 14 luxury homes, once valued in the millions, now next to worthless. The problem, sinkholes like this one have become more frequent, as underground water eats away at unstable soil beneath roads and houses. Engineers say it's so bad, lives are now at risk. The people who are responsible for this debacle are the district, um, the developer, the provincial government. Engineers say a fix could cost more than the town's entire yearly budget of $12 million. Who's responsible? That hasn't been determined yet. And I think, you know, today has been focused on, and the last week has been focused on making sure the residents are safe. Physically, we are going to a 500 square foot cabin. And For now, this family has to grapple with leaving behind a home, upset their son was unable to gather all his belongings before they were shut out. And there's things that we can't take that are his things. It's just unbelievable. It's unclear if their home insurance will cover any of this. You know, we're, we're leaving here um, in disgrace and we, and we did nothing wrong. We bought a house in, in a subdivision that was approved by the district of, of Seashell. For now, they simply have to walk away with accountability for this mess apparently a long way off. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Seashell, BC. Our moment is next, and it's a moment one young Leafs fan will never forget. To say this made her day would be a massive understatement. We will show you the scrapbook-worthy snap next. But first, we want to show you a bit of something we have for you on Sunday night on The National. Lance Stroll is the only Canadian on the F1 circuit. He's just 20 years old and heading to his third season on the track. But before that starts, Andrew sat down with the young racer to talk about his new car, what comes next, and distinguishing himself from his famous father. You have to almost push away a little bit, that you have to dissociate yourself from your dad to kind of tell people, no, I, mm. I earned my spot. Mm, well, I do my talking on the track. There's been a lot of criticism um, 
from the outside that I fuel off of because I, 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 I try and look at everything with, uh, you know, uh, with a smile on my face. But my dad's helped me so much along the way just with support and, uh, you know, um, without him, uh, the journey over to Europe from Canada and all that wouldn't have been possible. So I'm extremely grateful, thankful, and I know that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be, to be in the position that I'm in. Do you feel like the criticism is unfair? I think everyone has an opinion and um, I accept that. And that's, that's it, that's where, I, um, that's where I draw the line. Leaf fans are famous for filling seats no matter where the team is playing. Last night in Las Vegas was no different. And one Ontario family got more than an exciting match against the Golden Knights. They got a memory that will last a long time. Ever wonder if players notice fans in the stands? Well, it's pretty clear that Maple Leaf star Mitch Marner did. And his touching Valentine's Day encounter with a young fan is tonight's moment. The sign she made with her mom and dad ahead of the game had one simple but maybe bold request. Mitch, be my Valentine. And as a small bonus, maybe a fist bump, a selfie, or a puck. And guess what? Well, the answer is yes. Not only did Marner flip her a puck, but he took the time to talk her through, through the glass, even telling her to turn around to take a selfie. Her face says it all. I went right over to her, obviously, saw the sign, and, um, you know, this is a pretty cool interaction, though. And because it was Valentine's, the league set the whole thing to music on their YouTube channel. Needless to say, she and her family were over the moon and promised to be at the Leafs game in Arizona tomorrow. You want a video illustration of unadulterated joy? It is her reaction after that selfie. It was incredible. And I, I don't know about you, but I know so many people who talk about encounters they had with their sports or music, mainly sports idols when they were little, and how that can cement their relationship to the team and the star for their whole life. For me, it was Ken Dryden. I was in grade eight. Only time in my life I was speechless. Made me a lifelong fan of both the Habs and him, and uh, for sure, she is a lifelong Leafs fan and Mitch Marner fan. That is The National for Friday, February the 15th. Good night.